Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the uh, Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, we're very fortunate today. Uh, we, we have with us um, Ethan Gelati. He is a uh, bi wildlife biologist with the New Jersey's uh, Conserve Wildlife um, Foundation. And he's going to talk to us a lot about rare bats in the Pinelands today. They've done some pretty uh, extensive studies and have a lot of really cool information. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ethan. And uh, we're going to learn about some of the bats of the Pine Barrens today. Looking forward to it. OK, hi there. Uh, can I be seen? Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. Yeah. It's always weird doing these things from the back end. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan. Uh, I, I work with Conserve Wildlife Foundation in New Jersey. We're a nonprofit in the state that works with basically any of the um, endangered and threatened species that we have uh, living here in our, our lovely little state. Um, my uh, area of expertise is on bats. As you could see, there's lots of little little bat little bat things going on uh, in my room. Bit of spooky decor because I'm that kind of guy. Um, but I'm here today to talk about Bats New Jersey, and particularly towards the end of my presentation, after we do a nice little overview on what bats are and what they're doing here in our state, um, talk a little about some of the research we did just this summer and over the past couple of years down in the Pinelands. So let me share my screen so y'all can see the presentation, and we will get going. So yeah, rare bats in the Pinelands. Uh, this was a uh, project that we had down in uh, the Pinelands area in Ocean County and, uh, oh boy, what is the other county? I don't remember. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was, I was down on this project as the bat expert for the group. I was there to um, identify bats and particularly monitor uh, putting transmitters on bats, all that stuff. We'll get into the, the nitty gritty later. Um, this, this project was a uh, joint between uh, Conserve Wildlife Foundation and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, one of the CWF biologists who was leading up this project, Megan Lyon, uh, she's fantastic, great to have on this project. Um, but before we get into any of that, uh, there, there's a couple other questions we kind of need to uh, go into, like, uh, let me, where's, where's the little arrow? There we are. Uh, what are bats? Uh, this is kind of an important question because uh, this is the topic of our entire talk today. Um, so I guess it's important to hit a couple things when it comes to bats, like bats are mammals. Uh, this seems kind of clear. They have hair. They give live birth. They feed their young milk. They're warm blooded. Uh, they're mammals just like you and me, uh, like cows, whales, wolves, primates, all those, all those fun little animals. Um, but it's also important to understand what bats are not and what bats aren't is rodents. A lot of people think bats, oh yeah, they're flying mice. Uh, you know, they're, they're little, little rodents soaring through the air. Uh, they're not, uh, they're actually their own independent group of animals, um, which is known as the order of Chiroptera. Uh, so Chiroptera is just fancy word speak, uh, <laughs> AKA Latin, uh, meaning hand wing. And that's because bats over evolutionary time uh, have developed what are their hands into wings. You could see in uh, that graphic up to the right that a, a bat hand, all the bones are analogous to, you know, what we find in the human hand, but their fingers have just gotten really long and thin and flexible over evolutionary time. And there's this nice little membrane that that goes between all their little phalanges uh, and that's how they fly, which is really cool because there's only one other group of animals in all of like the universal history, at least as it pertains to earth, uh, that's developed a method of flying that's at all similar to bats. And that was the pterodons or your pterodactyls, but they just had a, a, a single phalange with a, uh, a skin membrane, whereas bats have your five. Uh, you can see it a little better uh, with these pictures here. Um, cool thing about bat wings is they're mildly translucent, uh, so we're able to shine a light behind them. We do this when we're, we're studying bats as a way to um, uh, be able to see wing damage. We use this as a metric to uh, determine bat health, but you could see from this picture that's, that's a hand. <laughs> 
and uh, uh, you could see it pretty clear in the coloration of this eastern red bat here as well. Uh, here is a really cool video to show you how bats fly. Uh, bat flight is just so cool to see. Uh, they are not capable of powered takeoff like birds can. They actually need to, they could do a little hop, uh, but mostly they drop and swoop. As you can see right there, uh, that means if a bat's on the ground, it can't actually take off. Um, it needs to climb up something so that it can kind of hop off and fly. Um, usually they'll climb up a tree, drop down, something like that. Um, but I, I just think that's neat. Uh, and this is just going to keep replaying till I figure out how to change the slide. There we go. Um, so there are over 1,200 species of bats known worldwide. Uh, 47 of those species can be found right here in the United States. And nine of those species uh, call New Jersey their home. This picture over on the side is actually the entire phylogeny of bats, which is this is uh, every species we know of so far uh, and how they are related to each other. Uh, as you can, there's, a, there's a lot of bats out there. Um, there is actually uh, so many bats. They, they account for a quarter of all mammalian species that we know of. Um, this is uh, kind of nuts. Uh, because they, they, they're second only to rodents. Um, rod, uh, rod, the, the, the group of rodentia accounts for, I think, two-thirds of all mammalian species. Um, and then this quarter are bats, and then there's, there's other guys in there. But I, I, I'm focusing on the bats here. Um, and they're, they're an incredibly diverse group of animals. You could see from this picture um, just all the different species uh, that we have around here and how they look. Uh, bottom we have a bonneted bat there's a dog-faced bat a honduran white bat leaf nose bat uh upper right hand corner is the visored bat uh we don't know why he's got a visor it could be to keep the sun out of his eye or the moonlight out of his eyes or it could be a mating thing we don't quite know uh bottom left hand corner you have uh oh what's his name tufted bat something like that uh that weird little tufty thing kind of like flops around on the top of his head uh I believe that's also for attracting mates, but we don't know. Uh, there, there's actually a lot that we don't know about bats. They, they are a notoriously difficult to study group of animals. Um, and there's so many of them uh, that there's, there's, there's a lot of questions still, still out there as to bat behavior and ecology and physiology to a degree. Um, we're still learning tons about them. We actually, my, my favorite bat right here is this guy in the left in the middle. That's the painted bat. Uh, it is actually bright orange. There is no color correction on that photo. Um, they are uh, little little Halloween decorations flying around in the night sky. And I, I just think that's real neat. Um, but there's so many different types of bats. Uh, and with that, they all have their, their, their different little uh, adaptations to uh, help uh, uh, navigate in the night and do all the little things they do. And, and, and with those adaptations, you, you get all these really different bats. Uh, some of them have big ears, like this little guy right here. Uh, but some of them have small ears. Because um, there's your two main groups of bats. You have your fruit bats and your micro bats. Uh, micro bats are little insectivorous bats. They, they fly around, they echolocate. Fruit bats eat fruit. Um, and they don't echolocate. Um, and if you don't echolocate, you don't need complex ears. So you get your fruit bats like this little guy with his little tongue sticking out. Um, and he's, you know, his ears aren't all that big. Uh, but some fruit bats have gigantic eyeballs. Uh, so this is actually a myth uh, that people think that uh, bats are blind. They're not. They can see about as well as you and I can. Uh, we'll get uh, into that a little more later. Um, but some fruit bats uh, have amazing eyesight. They actually have eyesight that is considered... Um, on par with uh, birds, even. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they use that to help pick out brightly colored flowers and fruit in the rainforest so they could get their food. Um, but some of them have really tiny eyes, like this little, little micro bat right here. Uh, you know, he echolocates at night. Uh, he doesn't really need uh, to be able to see all that well. Um, so, you know, a little less energy going into those eyeballs, those little, little, little dots right there. <laughs> um, some of them are super fuzzy, like this woolly bat right here. Uh, bats are 
all across the globe. Uh, there are no bats in Antarctica, uh, as, at least as far as we know. Um, but they you know they 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 encompass lots of different climates. So uh, this this little woolly bat here, you know, he's got all this fuzz that helps him uh, handle some colder temperatures. Uh, but there's other guys live in the rainforest, like this guy, the naked bat. Uh, he's naked. Uh, no fur on him anywhere. Uh, and when you're in the rainforest, I mean, you you don't really need to uh, uh, be able to, uh, you know, insulate yourself. It's hot. Uh, some of them are objectively very cute, like this fruit bat here with a mouth full of banana and his eyes bulging out of a skull. I think it's pretty cute. Some people think it's weird, um, but ah, I like them. Uh, and some of them are pretty darn ugly, objectively speaking, like this guy, the wrinkle faced bat. Um, he's got a wrinkly face, as you could tell. Uh, a bit, a bit of a face only a mother could love. Uh, but I love him as well, and I guess that makes me his mom. I don't know. Eh. Uh, <laughs> uh, this guy's actually super cool in that. So he, this is a microbat. It's considered a microbat. So insectivorous, echolocating. You'd think, right? Wrong. Uh, the wrinkle faced bat actually uh, eats fruit even though it's a microbat because uh, he likes to throw off all of our, our, our cladistics and uh, classification. Um, and those wrinkles and that naked face there uh, actually helps him uh, burrow into fruit with his face to, to get at the, the nice fleshy bits on the inside. And he's actually got this really wide mouth um, that, that with full of razor sharp teeth to just bore his way into mangoes. Um, so there's the smallest bat, and actually the smallest mammal in the world is a bat, known as the kitty's hognose bat or the bumblebee bat. You can find this guy in Thailand. Um, he's about uh, two and a half inches, nose to tail, uh, four inch wingspan, four or five inch wingspan. Um, it weighs uh, less than a penny. Uh, this, this bat weighs about two grams, two to five grams, something like that. Uh, super tiny. This is this is a little little friend, um, which is just I I'm constantly amazed at, at what bats can can pull off. And uh, it turns out they can pull off being super tiny, uh, but they can also pull off being gigantic. Uh, the largest bats in the world are a group known as the flying foxes. This is a group of fruit bats. Uh, the largest bat ever found. Uh, so it's like single bat we ever found. Uh, was a uh, giant golden crown flying fox. The largest bat on average is the large flying fox. Um, so on average, a large flying fox, uh, so a, they average a wingspan of four foot 11 inches, uh, which is nuts, uh, and beaten by this one giant golden crown flying fox that scientists found that had a wingspan of five foot six. Uh, that's a big boy. Uh, but it's also a big boy that uh, wants bananas. He has, they, there, there are no bats that attack or eat people. You don't need to worry that there are gigantic bats flying around. They just want your mangoes. Uh, bats use echolocation, as I said before. Bat echolocation is so fascinating. Uh, they make a, a, a high-pitched noise. This is known as an ultrasound. It's out of our range of hearing. Uh, that sound reverberates off their environment, uh, echoes echolocation echoes back towards them uh, and they process that sound uh, through their ears and their little brains uh, and that lets them form a picture of the world around them. They can tell if an object is stationary, the size of the object, the object is moving away from them, towards them. Um, it is actually so fine-tuned they could see down to the thickness of a single human hair through echolocation alone. Uh, nuts. Insane. Uh, super cool. Bats are fascinating. <laughs> and this is a video. I, I, I hope that sound can be heard through uh, my computer here. But this is a little video of what bat chatter sounds like, uh, which I think is really cool. So they can make noises within our range of hearing. But they are also able to produce those ultrasounds for echolocation. Uh, some adaptations they have for echolocation are the bats you'll see in the, the pictures we've seen before. And in this picture right here, uh, they have highly, highly developed ears. 
Um, this spotted bat right here has particularly gigantic ears, so you could see uh, all these parts all the better. And it's actually uh, a completely analogous to the parts of the human ear. The pinna is that like spoon I'm wearing over the end a hat, so I can't really show you. Um, but that spoon part on the outside of your ear, that's your, your pinna, and bats have a pinna as well. Bats also have a tragus, and your tragus is that little little cartilage nub kind of uh, on the front side of your ear hole. Uh, that's your tragus, and bats have one as well. So their, their pinna has become kind of larger and more spoon-shaped over evolutionary time. That's to help you know, pick up sound like a little satellite dishes. Um, and their tragus has gotten long uh, and fleshy and protruding. Um, and it actually works in some species kind of like a tuning fork so that when sound, uh, you know, besides getting uh, funneled into the ear by the, the pinna, uh, the tragus will actually vibrate slightly with those sounds. It kind of works like a tuning fork, bringing that sound directly right into his ear bones, which is really neat. Um, which is, you're going to hear me say that phrase so many times. It's just, it's neat. These bats are neat. Like this guy, who's super neat. Um, some bats have just made their whole face in here. Uh, this guy, uh, have, you know, your, your ear has all these wrinkles on the inside. You know, it's kind of, it's not like a smooth, just hole on the side of your head it has all these little wrinkles there. And all those wrinkles are to help funnel sound into your eardrums. So if you're echolocating and you're constantly moving forwards, why wouldn't you just move your ears to the front of your face and just make your whole face in here? Uh, so this guy, those wrinkles have moved to the front of his face, um, and his ears are particularly forward facing, and that makes his whole face kind of one big little ear satellite dish. So when sound hits the front of his face, it'll move through those wrinkles and right down into his little ear holes, which is super cool. He made his whole face in here. Uh, the little brown bat's actually the longest lived mammal, uh, uh, of its size, uh, you think uh, most mammals that are, are small like this are uh, particularly short lived. I know bats aren't rodents, but think of rodents. They're, they're of comparable size um, and they, they tend to only live a few years at the most. Uh, uh, the oldest little brown bat we ever recovered. Uh, I did not personally recover it. I read the scientific paper of people who did um, and they estimated based on mark and recapture and I believe uh, dating technique using its teeth. Uh, they estimated that this little brown bat was 32 years old. Which is insane. <laughs> this little guy is 32. This nuts. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is, um, I was just speaking with Joel before this talk, that there's, there's a lot of studies going on with uh, bat biology and their internal workings to learn how they live this long. And, and hopefully that's something that can uh, be transferred to human health one day uh, so that we can, you know, maybe uh, get a, a comparable uh, life extension uh, as, as our bats have here. Um, they also reproduce incredibly slowly for mammals of their size. Again, think rodents. Rodents have lots of babies. Uh, bats don't really have that strategy. Uh, bats uh, give birth to a, a fairly large and, and well-developed pup and only one pup at a time on average. Um, your uh, eastern red bats, your, your, your migratory species will uh, sometimes have twins or triplets, um, multiple pups at a time, but, but most of the bats you're going to find here in New Jersey are going to uh, only have one pup a year. Uh, that pup is very developed. Uh, looking at the size of a bat pup and the size of a bat mom, it would be equivalent to a human being giving birth to a watermelon. So um, bat moms go through a lot. <laughs> um, when, when a, uh, a bat's born, it'll, it'll cling to its mom for uh, a day or two before it uh, builds up the appropriate strength to be able to hang out in the roost alone uh, without mom. Mom will go out during the night, get her food, come back in, check on the, the pup occasionally, feed them, that kind of stuff. Um, and these guys will be full grown and ready to fly in their own within a couple of months. Um, this is a picture here of an Eastern red bat I met over the summer. She was very pregnant. Uh, as you can see, she's got a nice little, little mommy bump going on there. Um, hopefully she had some healthy pups after getting caught by Miss Net. Um, but this is just to show you how how big uh, developing pups are within a bat. They're 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 big babies. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit here about the bats we have here in New Jersey. This is Jersey and this is for the Pinelands. So we we got to make our way down to the Pinelands with this talk. We can't just talk about bats in general. Um, so there are nine species of bats that we have here in New Jersey. Uh, three of them are part-time residents, means they're migratory. They fly south for the winter, just like birds do. Uh, you know, some birds do, just, you know, some bats do. Uh, those are our silver-haired bat, our hoary bat, and our eastern red bat. Uh, these guys tend to be fluffier, handle the cold a little better. Um, and they uh, uh, will uh, roost during the daytime in leaf litter on trees, just kind of hanging off a tree, uh, hiding out in those leaves. That's why they tend to have these colorations, helps disguise them a little better that way. Um, they're actually the only bats we have here in the state that have hair down onto their tail membranes. Uh, most other bats we have do not have hair in their tail membranes. And this is so when these bats are migrating, um, they're hitting colder patches uh, on their flight. Uh, when they rest up, they're actually able to kind of flip their tail membrane over their faces and make little fuzzy sleeping bags out of themselves, which I think is adorable. Uh, our full-time residents, there are six of them. Uh, we have our northern long-eared bat, our Indiana bat, our eastern small-footed bat, our tricolored bat, our little brown bat, and our big brown bat. Um, when I say full-time residents, these are our cave hibernating bats. Uh, these guys are here year-round. Um, they're active in the spring. They have their pups. They raise them through the summer. Uh, pups fledge. Uh, they go out on their own. Um, and then in the fall, they all meet up again, go to hibernate in caves here in New Jersey, um, and start the process all again come spring. Um, so you'll notice some red lettering on this slide. That's because the Indiana bat, the northern long-eared bat, are considered, uh, Indiana bat is considered federally endangered. Uh, this is mainly due to the effects of habitat loss. They've been listed since sometime in the 1970s. Um, Northern long-eared bat is considered threatened. Um, it has listings both uh, nationally and in the state. Um, and we, we, we are likely going to see further listings of bats, particularly the little brown bat, uh, sometime within the next couple of years. This is mainly due to the effects of a fungal pathogen called white nose syndrome that has decimated bat populations in uh, the northeastern part of North America. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later. So uh, let's talk about a year in the life of a bat here in New Jersey. What, what do bats do all year? Well, uh, fall and the winter, uh, they, uh, uh, sometime around this time of year, uh, the bats are going to start prepping uh, for their hibernation. They're going to be packing on the pounds. Um, and then sometime around late October, early November, uh, they will begin congregating at the caves where they will be spending their winters. Um, when they head to those caves, they'll form a mating swarm outside of the cave. Um, this is, they, the bats are kind of indiscriminate maters. Uh, uh, they'll just, you know, kind of fly around, mate with a bunch of the other bats, uh, and then make their way into the caves. Uh, really interesting thing about bats is they're not pregnant while they're hibernating. That would be a uh, kind of uh, nuts endeavor for, for such a tiny animal. Um, bats actually um, delay fertilization. Uh, of they, they don't form an embryo uh, until the springtime uh, uh, where the, the females will basically self-fertilize um, from the uh, partners they had in the fall and then become pregnant come spring when they emerge from hibernation, which is not, mammals don't do that by and large. Uh, so it's, it's really cool that we have, uh, uh, a group of mammals that, that employ a strategy that, you know, you, you see most commonly in, in like fish and reptiles. Um, and cool thing with this, uh, I just read a, a, a study someone did and they found that Eastern red bats, uh, even though they fly south for the winter, um, uh, when, when they mate, uh, I, possibly due to similar strategies like this, because they have multiple pups, uh, we found that they can have multiple paternity over these multiple pups, uh, which is neat. That's nuts. That's are weird. We're learning a they're a weird group of animals. Um, so anyway, uh, once they, they settle in, uh, they actually have really high site specificity. Um, and uh, a bat will often go back to the exact same spot that it has hibernated previously in that cave. Uh, so that's kind of cool. 
Um, so they'll settle into the area in the cave uh, where they're going to be hibernating. This is a picture of some stalagmites. Uh, I think so. I always get this wrong. You, you stalactites are the ones on the ceilings because you want them to stay tight to the ceiling uh, or else they'll fall and hurt you. Uh, and stalagmites are, are the ones coming out of the ground. You want to be careful because you might fall and land on a stalagmite. I could be wrong. <laughs> I'm just going to assume I'm right here. Um, but then you see the picture on the right there. Uh, that is a bat, and that is not uh, a, a Swarovski crystal. Uh, that is a bat who has a bunch of condensation from the cave on his back. And this is important because when bats are hibernating, they are using a process known as torpor. Uh, and torpor is really cool because it is super hibernation. Uh, it is probably a really, really reductive way to talk about it, but we're going to talk about it in this way um, uh, for, for, for brevity's sake. So when a bat is utilizing torpor, uh, they drop their body temperature down to ambient air temperature. Uh, so uh, the caves they hibernate in stay uh, around 40 to 55 degrees, somewhere within the temperature range. Oh, so their body temperature drops to that temperature. Uh, their heartbeat slows uh, so that their uh, heart beats two or three times a minute. <laughs> um, and their breathing slows so that they're breathing only one or two times a minute. Uh, their metabolism is hovering just above what is needed to sustain life. Uh, and that's because they're so tiny. There's only, only so much weight they could put on them over winter. Um, and that's just, it's, it's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool that they do that. This is a picture from Hibernia Mine. This is one of the top hibernaculas that we have here in New Jersey. It's up in North Jersey around Rockaway. Um, this guy uh, had been banded previously, as you could see from that little metal piece on his wing. Um, and this little brown bat was, was there a little early. I was in there to uh, pull some temperature loggers uh, and uh, other uh, monitoring devices that we have in the cave uh, for ongoing studies. Um, and this guy was there just a little early, hanging out, being fuzzy, looking cute. Uh, spring in the summertime, uh, bats will emerge from their uh, spots where they hibernate. Uh, they will spread out around the tri-state area. Um, and go, uh, uh, moms will form maternity colonies. Uh, this is, uh, uh, mom bats will congregate in groups from anywhere of like 35 to over 100 bats, um, where they will have and raise their babies as kind of a big collective. Uh, their strength in numbers, you know, if you want to be, want to be safer. Um, and uh, male bats will actually, uh, they're, they're far more solitary. Um, they will, you know, be alone or, you know, group up with uh, two or three other males for what's known as a, a bachelor colony. Uh, just kind of be bros, hang out for the summer. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, the, the spots where they'll roost, they'll roost under loose bark and trees, um, in uh, snags or standing dead trees, fallen dead trees. Um, our, uh, your your uh, uh, big brown bats are, are, are uh, far more often artificial nesters. These are the bats that you'll find in the eaves of houses, uh, living in bat houses, in barns. Uh, this picture on the left is actually from the belfry of a church because bats are anything if not stereotypical. Um, they love belfries. Um, and yeah, that's what they'll uh, they'll do for the summer, raise their babies, and then they, they start this all again come winter. Um, your uh, migratory bats, as I said, when it starts getting cold, they start migrating south for the winter. Uh, they'll spend their winters in warmer climates and then head back up here come spring. Uh, there's there's a lot that still needs to be learned about how bats migrate. Um, we, we, we don't know all that much. We just know that they do uh, fly south for the winter. Um, the, the bats we have here in New Jersey will probably fly as far south as Carolinas. But, uh, you know, there, there are eastern red bats in Canada. Um, and those guys might fly down really only as far south as Jersey. Um, and they'll overwinter here because uh, it's a little less cold. Um, they'll they'll sometimes they've they've been known to hibernate in leaf litter on the ground that gets snow covered because that'll then insulate them kind of like an igloo and it'll keep a pretty constant temperature and they'll overwinter that way. Uh, but again, this is going to go bats are neat and we don't know a lot about them. Uh, but you know that that's a cool little thing. Uh, here's a, a good close up of that picture of these these bats hanging out in that belfry. 
bunch of big brown bats looking cute, serving up looks. Um, they'll, they'll roost kind of anywhere, uh, like this unusual choice. This was a house for a very long time in Flemington, New Jersey, uh, that had bats roosting between the screen and the storm window of uh, their son's bedroom. And there was a webcam running live for a very long time on the CWF website uh, where you can just watch these bats live. Um, I, actually, I need to reach out to this family sometime soon to see if their bats have come back. Uh, I'd love to uh, get this webcam up and running again. But as you can see, bat if it is within the right temperature range and gives them safety, shields them from the elements and predators, they will go for that spot. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the benefits of bats. Bats are incredibly beneficial uh bats we have here in new jersey and actually almost all bats north of texas are micro bats they're insectivorous uh, 150 big brown bats uh will prevent the production of 20 million uh corn rootworm larva uh, a year um this is to say that bats are incredibly important for agriculture uh they're also incredibly important for forest health and human health they eat just about every insect you could think of that is a pest for agriculture, health, and for our forests. Uh, they eat stink bugs, really big. People hate stink bugs. They eat mosquitoes. They eat the species of mosquitoes that carry uh, Zika and West Nile virus. Bats cannot get either of these diseases. So when they eat uh, an infected mosquito, a uh, bat boy is out of there. No, not can't infect anyone, can't uh, spread those diseases anymore. They also eat the moths that form tent caterpillars, and uh, uh, they eat Japanese beetles, corn borers, cone worms, all of these different uh, animals that affect the health of our trees and, and plants and agriculture, all this stuff. And this is, uh, it's very important to drive home just how important bats eating bugs is to the environment. They form what we would call a, an ecosystem service. Uh, now, an ecosystem service is anything that an animal does uh, that is beneficial to humans. Uh, this is just what, what an animal does in its, its normal life, uh, its, its, its regular life history that is uh, benefit to people. And, and bats are vitally important insect pest regulators. So, so one little brown, brat, little brown bat can eat around 3,000 insects a night. If that is a pregnant or nursing mom bat, she can eat 3,500 to 4,000 insects a night. Uh, for, for reference, uh, we, we estimate that bats uh, are worth uh, about $74 per acre of cropland in the United States. Uh, this is about 50 to $73 million a year, likely more than that. Um, in terms of costs saved, because uh, farmers don't need to use as many uh, pesticides or mitigation techniques to keep their crops healthier uh, if the bats are eating all of the pests that would then be eating those crops. Uh, and this is super important because it doesn't just save us money. You know, economics, end of the day, is the U.S. We're big on money uh, and, and uh, uh, saving money. Um, so the, the, the dollar amount is, is important for business, but just for ecologically speaking, if bats are eating the pests and we don't need to use pesticides, those pesticides aren't going into our food. They're not going into the environment. Um, and that's, you know, really important because these, you know, uh, agricultural pesticides are, are kind of a, uh, we don't want to use them. We don't want to be using chemicals to, to to kill insects and kill all these other pests because you know it leaks into the environment and it leaks into our food and it's not healthy. Um, so the more bats we have, the less we need to use that and the uh, uh, healthier we can be uh, as an environment and as people. Um, and because bats are so important, uh, uh, it's uh, important to say that in New Jersey, it is illegal for anyone to harm or kill a bat for any reason. Doesn't matter if it's a protected species or not, all bats are protected species here in New Jersey. And that's why we have a do not disturb date between May 1st and July 31st. You cannot do bat evictions uh, during this time period. This is uh, if someone has bats in their attic or in the eaves of their house, something like that. Um, they don't want those bats there anymore, which is understandable. It is, it is perfectly safe to live with bats, cohabitate with bats in your home. 
uh, as long as those bats or their, you know, their feces, whatnot, are not getting into your living quarters. If you're, you have a disused attic uh, or, you know, leaves your house, something like that, it's perfectly safe to have bats living there. But understand bats can cause damage. Uh, their feces can accumulate. So you don't want them there anymore. Uh, there are specific dates you need to work in to do that. And this is specifically because uh, May 1st to July 31st, uh, this is when bats have pups and their pups are not able to fly. So if you do a bat eviction, uh, usually this involves putting devices up that let bats fly out, but not back in. Um, those pups are then stuck in your attic uh, and those pups will die. And then you'll have dead animals in your attic. And I don't think anyone particularly wants dead animals in the wall. Outside of it being illegal and also bad because bats are dying. Um, it's why it, it's very important. Um, so, so there's no centralized um, license to do bat exclusions, though there are uh, best practices on the Conserve Wildlife website. I, I actually do have a listing up on our Bats and Buildings page of um, uh, uh, what's it called uh, pest control companies we know do bat exclusions the right way. Um, if you do want to do a professional route, um, if you want to do a bat exclusion yourself, though, uh, you do need to be aware of these uh, best practices and uh, go dates and no go dates uh, in order to do your exclusion uh, as uh, uh, safely and as good for the bats as possible. Um, but yeah, um, besides taking out so many forest pests and human health pests and garden pests, a lot of bats are actually primary pollinators, which is really cool. So your fruit bats uh, don't just eat fruit. Uh, some of them are nectar bats, uh, which means they, they feed on nectar from flowers, you know, kind of like hummingbirds or butterflies. Um, and because of that, they are also uh, really, really important pollinators. Uh, and they're primary pollinators, which means they are the main animal to pollinate certain species of flowers. Um, this is uh, lots of cactus flowers. Um, in, in desert areas uh, or other um, uh, fruiting uh, trees in rainforests in uh, South American countries or Southeast Asia. Um, a particular fruit bats are also important for seed dispersal. So you think your uh, cacao, um, mangoes, bananas, things like that, bats help those life cycles. Um, but in terms of pollination, a bat is actually the primary pollinator of the blue agave. Uh, which is what we use to get agave nectar, which is uh, something you could, you know, use as an alternative sweetener for your coffee. Uh, it's also how we get tequila. So the adults watching, uh, you could thank bats for uh, your Patron and your lovely drinks. Um, I don't know why Bacardi is a bat. Uh, that's rum. That's not from agave. Uh, tequila companies, we need, we need one highlighting bats and, and working with bat conservation because bats are how we get that food product. Um, and bats, they have all these adaptations to, to help them pollinate flowers. Uh, they tend to have longer tongues to help them uh, reach that nectar. They tend to have longer faces um, so that they can uh, reach into flowers. Um, the fuzziness of a bat uh, really helps pollination. This is you know, not an adap adaptation they have, but it's just a, a side effect uh, that helps pollinate all of these different flowers. If you look to the right side of my slide here, this guy is one of my favorite bats. Uh, I say this about every bat I highlight because all bats are my favorite bats. But this guy, right now, the I I learned a great principle from a uh, birding teacher, an ornithology professor, uh, who said that uh, when you're asked if you're ever running a, uh, uh, you know, it could be a, a bat walk, an ecological walk, a birding expedition, um, he'd often get asked, uh, which bird is your favorite bird? Um, and his answer has always stuck with me. Um, and it's kind of how I approach bats um, and birds too, because I do do some bird work. Uh, it's you know, what, what, what bat's my favorite? You know, it's the bat, it's the bat I'm currently looking at. Uh, that, that's my favorite bat. Right now I'm looking at the long-tongued bat. Long-tongued bat has a really long tongue. How long is its tongue? About as long as its body. Uh, as you could see from this picture, uh, they uh, drink nectar from a very deep stemmed uh, species of flower. They are actually uh, one of the only animals that's able to reach that nectar. Um, they are specifically adapted to uh, feed off of this type of flower. If you look at that picture of the bat with his face in the tube, his tongue goes all the way down to the bottom of that tube. 
His tongue is so long it doesn't fit his fuzzy little face. Um, the base of his tongue actually reaches in a special pouch that sits between his heart and his sternum. Uh, it is so long. And that is so his tongue can kind of like pull back uh, and squish in there uh, so that we don't have a bat flying around with a gigantic tongue flopping around because that's not very aerodynamic. Um, other benefits of bats. Bat guano, fertilizer. Um, you can buy bags of bat guano uh, to fertilize your garden. It's very nitrogen rich, has all the vitamins and minerals your plants need to grow. Uh, last time I updated this presentation, it was about 648 a pound. Uh, might be a little more or less right now. I don't know. <laughs> um, but you can buy bags back on out for your fertilizer. Or if you have a bat house in your property or bats um, around that drop guano and you collect that guano, use it as gray fertilizer. But bats are also responsible for a lot of uh, advances that we have medical science and technology, which is super cool. So uh, uh, we have extensively studied their echolocation. They're one of the animals that we studied that helped us develop sonar. Um, uh, along with uh, dolphins, other, other echolocating animals. Um, but also uh, when it comes to medical science, uh, we've extensively studied vampire bats in particular. Um, so vampire bats, uh, you know, they feed off blood and their saliva has very uh, uh, interesting properties to it in that it has antibacterials to keep bite sites from getting infected, uh, but also anticoagulants so that the blood continues to flow uh, as the bat is trying to drink from its host. Um, and we've studied these to develop, to develop new antibacterial agents, but also new blood thinners uh, based on the compa compounds found within vampire bat saliva. Um, so your uh, blood thinning medications for, for people with uh, uh, blood issues, heart disease, things like that, we could thank bats for, for the advancements of some of those medications. Uh, but let's talk a little bit uh, about the myths and misconceptions about bats, because there's a lot of them. I'm going to kind of uh, blow through these because I've been rambling a lot about bats, and we have so much more to talk about. Um, bats are not blind, and I have too much free time because I, I photoshopped a pair of glasses onto a bat. As I said earlier, this is uh, people think that bats are blind because they echolocate. They just use sound to navigate. Uh, echolocation is just their form of night vision. Uh, it is how they see at nighttime, but they can see a bat as well as you and I can. Uh, so bats aren't blind. Uh, they do not attack humans, and they do not become entangled in hair intentionally. Uh, this is a weird old wives' tale. One, there, there have been no document case, documented cases of bats intentionally attacking people. Um, there have been uh, bat-human interactions. Um, these are not intentional attacks. It's usually a bat... Uh, getting trapped in a location and panicking, getting confused, and a person panicking, getting confused, and kind of running into each other. Um, they also do not intentionally become entangled in hair. As I was talking about earlier with their echolocation, they, their echolocation is basically like eyesight, better than eyesight. Uh, they can see you, um, and they are incredibly agile flyers. They can turn on a dime. Uh, so if you're ever hiking out at night and you think bats are flying at your head and trying to attack you, they're not. They're usually trying to swoop in to get a good look at you because uh, they're not used to seeing people at nighttime where they live. They're like, what's that big gangly creature? Let me get a look. And they scream at your head and they're like, oh, it's a person. Fly away. Um, one thing people don't think about is um, humans are big, warm bodies walking through uh, the forest at nighttime and that attracts insects. Um, you think, oh, this forest is just full of mosquitoes. No. Uh, it's, uh, those mosquitoes are attracted to you. They're following you. Um, and because those insects are following you around, well, you're just a little walking buffet. You got a buffet circling around your head. And that's why those bats are swooping in. They're trying to pick off those little bugs that are trailing you as you, uh, hike around at nighttime. Uh, and also this is a picture of a bat biologist who, to prove this myth wrong, uh, well, Miss Netting took one of those bats and stuck it in her hair. And lo and behold, it crawled to the top of her head and flew away because it wants nothing to do with her. Because we're big and scary and bats are tiny and uh, they, uh, they don't want anything to do with us. Uh, there are no vampire bats in North America and they do not feed off humans. Um, there are four species of vampire bats all found in South America. None of them found in North America. Uh, so if you were ever growing up and you thought that we had vampire bats here in New Jersey, we do not. Uh, and they also don't feed off people. There have been 
a handful of documented documented cases of vampire bats ever feeding off humans. Um, and those are uh, very special uh, circumstances of either a, a confused bat or a, a starved bat looking for an easy meal. Um, I, one of those cases was some dude who did it intentionally for a uh, National Geographic special. Uh, so, uh, yeah, by and large, bat, vampire bats never feed off people. Um, they primarily feed off of birds, uh, small mammals, and livestock, uh, which is uh, really interesting. And, and uh, vampire bats are cool in uh, this one specific interest. Uh, so uh, vampire bats are colonial. They, they form large colonies. Uh, they'll fly out, get their meals. A uh, vampire bat actually really only drinks a few milliliters of blood a night. Uh, so not even very much if they do when they do feed off animals. Um, uh, they, they never kill their, their, their prey or their hosts. Uh, this would be counterintuitive because then you don't have a source of blood to go back to. This is why their, their saliva has all these really cool properties to it to help keep those bite sites from getting infected uh, so that they you know, can come back and feed off that animal again. Um, but when they all come back to their colony in the morning, uh, if one bat notices that his neighbor has not gotten a full meal, well, blood's not very calorically dense. Uh, so if a bat doesn't have a full tummy when it goes to bed, it, it likely will burn through those calories very fast, be weaker the next day, not be able to get more food, and that bat can very easily starve. So in a colony, uh, one bat notices his neighbor doesn't have a full tummy, but he does. Uh, he'll regurgitate a little bit of his meal to his neighbor. And they do that and spread their meal out through the entire colony so that, uh, you know, everyone's all the better. Uh, this is one of the only instances of true altruism that we see within the mammalian kingdom. Uh, altruism is when one animal does something to benefit another animal with no direct benefit or a detriment to itself. Um, thick bees... Uh, B will sting an intruder, that B dies, but the colony is protected, that's altruism, and vampire bats uh, perform something very similar with this, this meal sharing. Uh, so if you leave this talk knowing anything today, uh, it's that uh, vampire bats are communists. I don't, it's, a, it's very difficult to tell jokes when you get no feedback. <laughs> um, all bats do not have rabies. Uh, one half of 1% of bats will ever contract rabies within their lifetime. When they do, they die very quickly. Um, within a few days, they will break off from their colony and try and find a quiet place where they can die alone. Uh, the problem is uh, rabies is a neurological disorder. Uh, the bats will, will behave erratically. They'll lose the ability to fly. They will often become active during the daytime. And when they do try and find their quiet place to pass away, sometimes that ends up being in a person's house. Um, and people, not particularly clever, uh, we either don't notice that the bat is around or people will go to pick up this bat they found in their kitchen um, and then a bite happens and that's how transmission can happen. That Bats are one of the top vectors of rabies to human transmission um, within uh, the United States. However, um, they are not one of the largest carriers or, or like uh, vectors of rabies. They just happen to uh, come into contact in humans in situations where uh, people, you know, won't notice them. It's, it's much easier to notice a rabid raccoon than it is bats. Bats are so tiny. So, so that's how that can happen, which is why you never handle wildlife. It is very important. I need to drive home. Never handle wildlife unless you are a trained professional. I'm a trained professional. I can handle bats. Um, I am rabies vaccinated just in case, even though when I interact with bats in the natural habitat, they're, they're very unlikely to have rabies. It's still a precaution. Um, so, you know, you never, never handle wildlife unless you are uh, being directed by or are a trained professional. Uh, bat guano is not deadly. This is another little myth out there. Uh, bat guano does carry a uh, bacterial pathogen known as histoplasmosis. Uh, this is actually in higher concentrations and more easily transmitted through bat, uh, not bat guano, <laughs> through bird guano. Uh, and with bat guano, it needs to be airborne. Uh, so bats are never going to congregate in uh, New Jersey in high enough numbers that you're going to have this be a real transmission risk uh, in, in like South America when uh, or other areas where bats congregate in the thousands. Uh, and guano piles up and piles up and piles up. 
then you'll see uh, scientists go into these caves wearing full respirators. But otherwise here, um, you just spritz the guano down with some water and the, the dust can't get up in the air and uh, you know, it's, it's not a transmission risk. Uh, what bat guano is though, is it's glittery. You can kind of see it in this picture, but if you crush up dried bat guano, uh, and shine a flashlight on it, it glitters. This is because of all those exoskeletons and wings from, uh, from insects that they eat. And if you actually look um, at bat guano under a microscope, like crushed up bat guano under a microscope, you'll see little insect legs and wing bits and all that stuff because that's undigestible. So bat guano, not deadly, sparkles. Um, also, bats cannot give you COVID or vice versa. I spent way too long photoshopping a mask on this bat and I could not get it to cover the bat's nose. So this bat is not wearing a mask correctly. The mask goes over your whole face over here so that the mask works. Masks work, by the way, as I can tell you as a scientist, I've read the papers. Um, but bats can't give you COVID. So there is a theory that COVID may have originated from a bat. When we say this, what we mean is uh, a bat had a coronavirus uh, that coronavirus mutated and spread to another animal. And then that COVID virus within that animal possibly mutated and then spread to a person. Uh, one of the theories is that it was originally within a, a Chinese horseshoe bat and then spread possibly to pangolins and then to people. Um, this is one of uh, the big issues with zoonotic diseases. That's, that's uh, diseases that transfer from animals to humans is that uh, mutating between different hosts, that's how it becomes virulent and, and becomes transmissible to people. Um, this has happened in the past, particularly with other coronaviruses. Uh, this is SARS and MERS. Uh, MERS spread from bats to camels to people. Um, and SARS, I, I don't know a whole lot more about SARS uh, epidemics in the past, but there's, there's possibility of, of bat hosts. Um, this is to say that bats just have uh, a number of coronaviruses that they, they are, are host to. Uh, humans have a number of different coronaviruses they're host to, which is a, a group of viruses. Um, and as it comes to studying uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, scientists are, are pretty sure at this point that we cannot give COVID-19 to our bats which is good. You'll still see in pictures that when we've been handling bats of late, we do wear uh, full N95 respirators as an extra precaution. Um, but also because we can't give COVID-19 to our bats, our bats do not have COVID-19. So you cannot get COVID-19 if you come into contact with a bat here in New Jersey or anywhere uh, for the fact of the matter. Um, so that's, you know, we, we don't know where COVID came from as it stands right now. These are just theories. Um, and you know, as it stands, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't even even if COVID-19 did come from bats, you still can't get COVID-19 from a bat because the coronavirus that that bat spread to another animal that spread to people. Well, you know, it, it mutated over time. It's this whole complicated virology thing that's even above my own head. Um, but let's talk a little bit about threats to bats. Uh, this is very important. Um, because bat bats are kind of up against a lot right now. Um, particularly white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome is a fungal pathogen popped up around the winter of 2006, 2007. Um, it is an invasive fungus uh, from Europe. Uh, that is the, the, the prevailing theory because it's naturally, uh, uh, the, the scientific name for white nose is uh, Pseudogymnastes destructans, if that tells you anything about what we're up against right now. Um, so it's naturally occurring in caves in Europe. Uh, we're pretty sure someone was just exploring caves in Europe. They didn't know. Uh, they came back to the United States and spores had gotten on their clothing or their boots. Um, and they explored this cave in Albany, New York. Um, we, we do know the, the ground zero of white nose syndrome. So, so what white nose syndrome does forms a little white fungal growth on the bat. As you can see in this picture here, it's got this little, little white fuzzy fungal growth, but it also grows on their wing membranes. Um, and what it does is it actually eats away at their wing membranes. And it can form little holes. Uh, that is one of the ways we're able to determine if a bat previously had a white nose infection is you'll see scarring on their wings uh, from where uh, uh, white nose had eaten away at their wing membranes. 
um, it doesn't keep them from flying. What it does is uh, think if you've ever tried to sleep with really bad sunburn or rash, um, it's very uncomfortable. Um, and this causes the bats to wake up repeatedly while they're hibernating. This causes them to become dehydrated. So they will fly in search of water. Um, it also causes them to burn through their fat stores, uh, which essentially starves a bat uh, to death uh, before springtime rolls around. When uh, white nose first hit, we saw mass, mass bat deaths. Um, these are just a few caves in the areas when white nose spread to them. Uh, they would just be carpeted with bats. Um, Hibernia mine in North Jersey used to be the number one hibernacula for little brown bats in the Northeastern United States. Um, it uh, used to have an estimated 30,000 bats uh, overwintering there every year. Uh, the last time we were in the cave in 2018, there were only around 300 bats. We, we lost 98 to 99% of the affected species. So that's the little brown bat and the Northern long-eared bat. Um, we're seeing some uh, uh, effects on the Indiana bat populations and possibly the small-footed populations. Uh, these bats uh, hibernate slightly different areas of the cave, so they're not quite as affected by white nose. Um, but, but those species that were affected the most uh, uh, have been really affected. And I actually need to update this map right here um, because I believe they've released a, a newer version. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, fall winter of 2006, 2007 was Albany. By 2008, 2009, it was in New Jersey. Um, and as of 2018, uh, this white nose has spread to the entire eastern half of Canada, the northeastern part of the United States. Uh, it has spread out to the Midwest, uh, parts of the Southwest. Um, it is very likely that white nose will. Uh, find its way into most hibernaculums uh, in North America. Um, it's less of an impact on the southern half of the United States because those bats don't really hibernate as much. Um, and they're able to, uh, if a bat, uh, we've noticed, we, we've learned, uh, if you take a bat with white nose um, and you uh, feed them, give them water, keep them warm through the winter, they can survive it very easily. The reason white nose is deadly is because the bats, it, it is winter, there's no food, there's not many, much water, um, so they can't refill those energy stores. Um, but it's, it's we, we are in a situation where there's not a lot we can do. There's no cure for white nose syndrome. Uh, it's a fungus, so it is very difficult uh, to treat. Um, we, there's no fungicide specific to white nose uh, as it stands, so we can't treat our caves. We would have to use a broad spectrum fungicide if we did, which would destroy the entire microenvironment of these caves. And we don't want to do that because that could have other unforeseen consequences. Um, so as it stands, we, we are currently just kind of waiting uh, and preparing uh, for areas white nose has yet to hit um, and doing all we can to prop up the populations in areas where white nose has already hit. Here in New Jersey, we're pretty sure our populations are not going to drop any lower directly due to white nose syndrome, but we are in a period where we need to see if those populations are going to be able to rise again. As I said earlier, bats reproduce incredibly slowly for mammals of their size. They only have about one pup a year. So adding to the population is incredibly slow going. And as it stands, we still don't quite know um, if there is enough genetic diversity left within our bat populations that they can form a viable population. This is, are they able to add more bats to the population, uh, give birth to enough bats that we can, you know, uh, uh, create a robust, large population to, to support um, uh, a bat population for years to come. Uh, but also, uh, if there is not enough genetic diversity left in our populations, if another pathogen rolls through and all our bats are very genetically similar, um, it is possible that all of them could be susceptible to that disease and it could, you know, create an extinction event. This is one of the fears we currently have for cheetahs, for example. Every cheetah alive in the world today is the descendant of only 50 individuals. This means uh, that they've bottlenecked. There's only, only so much genetic diversity left in that population. So if a disease rolls through that 
uh, uh, kills one cheetah, it's likely that all the other cheetahs would be susceptible to that disease and it could wipe them out. That, that is a fear we have for our bats. So while we, we think that uh, bats aren't going to die directly due to white nose syndrome anymore, the bats we have, uh, there have been some genetic studies that show that our bats are rapidly evolving and adapting um, and able to survive uh, white nose infections over winter or avoid them or mitigate their effects, which is very good news. That is great to hear that bats are adapting. But are there enough of those bats left um, to reproduce effectively? Are they able to spread uh, and pass on those uh, adaptations to their young? We got to wait and see. Uh, it's really slow going. Um, but, you know, that that is the good news that that, you know, bats might be recovering. And also there are bats that uh, uh, there's lots of bats in Europe um, and there's white nose in Europe. So one of the theories is possibly the European bat population is a post white nose bat population. Bats there don't congregate in large numbers in caves. Uh, and that could have been due to a historic white nose uh infection event. We, we, we don't really know. Um, but that, that theory uh, gives us a lot of hope that, that bats can overcome this. And, and I, I really hope they can, because I, I love the little guys. Um, other, other things affecting bats, I realize I've hit 11, I think. Um, I'm going to go, try uh, and take questions within the next 10 minutes. Uh, I just got to blast through this. Um, wind energy, something that bats have to deal with, uh, migratory bats in particular. Uh, wind patterns uh, across the globe. Uh, there's different wind currents that kind of go around, either going north or south. Um, and these prevailing winds are really important flyways for migratory animals. So it's migratory birds and bats. Uh, because it's particularly windy in these areas, this is where we put up wind energy, um, which has been a problem because those blades spin faster than you think. Uh, you'd think, oh, a bat can just avoid that uh, a large tower. Well, the bat thinks it can get around it, but it actually creates a vortex, which sucks air in. So those animals get sucked in and crushed in the pressure, uh, which is not great. Um, this has caused an estimated 500,000 bat deaths a year uh, in those migratory species. Um, but we found that cutting the speeds uh, that these turbines spin at during peak migratory periods uh, uh, allows us to still generate electricity, but also reduces mortality by around 93%, which is great. This is, I've introduced a problem that bats have, and we're close to solving it, which is awesome. And there's also work on new uh, uh, wind energy technologies, whether it is offshore or bladeless turbines, things like that, um, have, have, have really helped to mitigate this as a um, massive issue that bats are dealing with. Um, also habitat loss. It's affecting every animal on the face of the planet is, is habitat loss, whether it's people developing land so that animals have their, their environments fragmented um, or just no habitat at all because there's a building development there. Um, uh, you know, less shagbark hickory means less roosting opportunities for northern long-eared bats. But the other side of habitat loss is climate change and climate change is very much impacting our bats. Uh, we're seeing possible climate change related um, population drops in the hoary bat populations, but also in a lot of our resident bats, uh, one of the big things that they rely on are vernal pools. Uh, vernal pools are uh, perennial uh, ponds. They, they fill up with water in the spring, uh, they dry up in the fall and the winter. Uh, these vernal pools are important for amphibian reproduction, but also insect reproduction. And those insects, great food for young bats. So maternity colonies often pop up around uh, vernal pools. And due to changing weather patterns, uh, hotter summers, things like this, we're noticing a reduction in the number of vernal pools popping up year after year. And if there's less vernal pools, that's less food for young bats and less areas for maternity colonies. Um, and that can really, really have an impact on the population. But Let's talk about our research and protecting New Jersey's bats uh, and what we're doing to help bats through all of these, all of these problems that they're up against. Uh, CWF does a lot of work uh, and the state does a lot of work uh, and Rutgers University and, and academics do a lot of work, whether it's researching white nose. Um, there's the summer bat count in the acoustics program. So I, I do a lot of work with acoustics, um, which is I have special detectors that can listen in 
and hear ultrasound. Uh, it records bat echolocation that way. I either have stationary points all throughout the state. You can see on the map here some of the different areas. Um, or uh, uh, mobile acoustic routes, which is that same principle, but we strap it to a car and drive around slowly uh, and record bats that way. Um, bottom right hand corner, that is a sonogram of a bat call. And actually based on the pitch and the pattern of that bat call, we can identify the species of the bat. So this is super important uh, for getting species assemblage in all these different areas and figuring out what bats are, are, are in different spots. Uh, CWF also, also runs a program called Bats in Buildings, where um, if someone does a uh, bat exclusion to get rid of bats on their property, uh, we'll put a bat house up for free um, so that uh, those bats have a place to go to uh, when they can no longer get into your attic. Um, but there's also the mist netting and radio telemetry project, which is what brings us finally to the Pinelands. I did it. I got us here. And I'm only over by five minutes and I'm probably going to talk for another 10. I'm so sorry. Um, but in 2021 uh, and also previously in 2019 to 2018, uh, uh, Conserve Wildlife was contracted to do mist netting down in the Pinelands. Um, and this was down in, I have it here on my phone. Unfortunately, I had it in the notes on my slide, but I can't use presenter view. Um, we uh, 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 netted down in Ocean in Burlington County. I got it. I found it. Um, and uh, so let's talk about that and, and the work we've done down in the Pinelands. So what is mist netting? Mist netting is we put up these, these large nets. Uh, it's of a, a very fine nylon. You can see in this picture the up hand, up, upper right-hand corner. Uh, this was that is uh, Stephanie Fagan, a former bat biologist for CWF and my, my previous boss. Um, uh, uh, so those nets go between two uh, uh, tall poles, as you can see in the picture on the left. Um, uh, uh, it, it is uh, kind of held up between those. We put them in areas we think bats are going to be flying to uh, through. The idea is the bats don't notice the net. Uh, they fly into it. They get caught, tangled up. We can go. We can untangle them. Uh, and then we take that bat, bat back to our, our uh, little base camp um, and we can look at their wings, look for white nose star scarring, we'll weigh the bats, uh, we'll band them. Each band has a unique color and ID on it so that looking at the band, you can uh, tell the species of the bat, but also look up that uh, uh, unique number ID that is on there and look into a database and be able to tell uh, all the previous information we've pulled from that bat. So that, um, you know, you could tell, has this bat uh, uh, had a white nose infection previously? How much did they weigh last year? Uh, are, are they heavier this year? Are they doing better? Are they doing worse? Uh, have they had pups before? You know, we can, we can look up all that information. Um, this is a, a, a video of a bat being released post being caught in the mist net. Uh, uh, I love these slow motion videos. Thank you, iPhone, for being able to do this. You can see they kind of fly off. Uh, what is my next video? Oh, this is a, a bat who wanted to take a rest on my hand after being caught up in a mist net. Uh, sometimes it can be a little stressful for our bats. We, we never handle a bat uh, after it is caught in a mist net for longer than a half hour. Uh, this is very important because we don't want to stress out the bats too much. Um, but sometimes just being handled, it can be very stressful for these animals. We try and be as gentle as possible. And this big brown bat decided uh, he needed a little rest <laughs> uh, before heading back out. And there he goes. Um, and what's radio telemetry? So the point of this project is if we get a target species, which is the little brown bat, northern long-eared bat, any of those biota species, myotis being their genus, um, we want to track where they're roosting. So we uh, put on them a, a radio tracker, which is this little chip you could see on the left-hand side. That gets glued to their back. Uh, so this is my little, my little demonstration. This is about the size of a bat we have here. They will be uh, held so that they're uh, uh, can't move their wings, they can't wiggle around. We'll part the hair on their back, uh, place the track, glue the tracker there, fold the hair over, put a little more glue there, uh, and then some cornstarch so that uh, it's not sticky and they can't get stuck to their own tracker on their back. 
um, is perfectly safe uh, to have these trackers on there. Uh, we make sure that it, the tracker weighs less than 5% of their weight, um, which is why we can't use like satellite trackers or things like that, because those trackers are far too large for our bats. Um, but also uh, um, the, the cement will uh, uh, come off uh, within two or three weeks, um, which is a bit of a joke because uh, bats are really good groomers. Um, and I have never had a tracker stay on a bat more than a week, less than a week. They always get those trackers off and you'll find them on the ground near a roost tree or something. So, so those first, the, the first day or two after you get a, a tracker on a bat is really important. Um, so that, that little chip uh, emits a, a pulse at a certain frequency, and I will have a little, little satellite-y uh, antenna, antenna-looking guy uh, up, hooked up to a receiver, and that will be tuned into that frequency. So if I am within a mile or a mile and a half of that little, little chip right there, and I point my uh, receiver in the direction of that chip, it will uh, emit a beeping sound. Um, so <laughs> we, we put a little tracker on a bat, we release them, and then we go back to that area in the daytime and we just walk and drive around until we get that pulse. And then we hone in on it and we keep walking towards it. We try and triangulate the area where that bat is roosting. Um, this is a picture of what it looks like doing that. This is me handling a little brown bat. I can't tell from this picture. I don't remember. Um, uh, while uh, that tracker is being affixed to his back, you can see it on the left hand side. Little antenna goes down the bottom, and then they have this little tuft that has been corn starched and glued uh, so that that tracker can be affixed. Um, when a tracker gets put on a bat, uh, we don't want them to uh, get their wings in the glue or to get that tracker off while it's drying. So they will get burritoed, um, which means that bat gets rolled up in uh, some canvas so that they cannot get away and they cannot hurt themselves. Uh, and this little guy, uh, uh, this little brown bat was not happy to be burritoed, uh, but there he is. Um, this is a better look at that tracker. You could see um, we try and get as much hair as possible over it so that uh, the bat can't get to it. It's kind of put right by their shoulder blades so that there's no way they can reach back to it. Um, and that tracker will be there. Uh, this is what it looks like tracking some days when you have no idea where the bat is and you hang out of a car. <laughs> And uh, you kind of, I'm so sorry for my man bun. Um, but sometimes you got to cover a lot of area. And that means you got to just hang out of a car and just hope, hope that that pulse gets picked up. And that one did. That was one of our successful tracking efforts, which was really cool. Uh, this summer down in the Pinelands, uh, we captured uh, 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 multiple Little brown bats, that's Myotis lucifugus, also known as Mylu. Uh, you could see their little face there. Um, uh, you know it is a little brown bat uh, uh, based on their size, their weight. They kind of look like small, less bulky faced big brown bats. Um, so the first bat that we captured and tagged um, uh, was a juvenile female. Uh, we spent nearly six hours tracking that bat the following day to a house um, uh, that was actually uh, nearby. Uh, we were never able to find bats emerging from the house uh, days after. So we think that the bat uh, you know, was roosting in the attic or the eaves somewhere. And while it was roosting, the tracker came off and the bat left. Um, and then uh, we just had a tracker in a house that we were uh, uh, finding our way to. Um, which is kind of, bats are notoriously one of the hardest animals to radio track. So the fact that we got any success there is fantastic. Um, this is a video of that friend yelling at me. This is, again, it's your very tiny guy being held by a very big guy, uh, and it could be a little scary. You can see I'm not actually wearing the super thick gloves you've seen in previous photos. Those gloves are to, to keep them from biting and breaking skin because that's a uh, 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 possible you know, rabies transmission, but also uh, it hurts <laughs> and you don't want that. Um, but little brown bats, northern long bats, they're so tiny, their teeth can't puncture nitrile gloves, um, which is great uh, to have that extra dexterity when handling them to keep the bat uh, and us as safe as possible. 
uh, when affixing a tracker, um, but it just shows they're so tiny. We also caught northern long-eared bats down in the Pinelands. That's uh, Myotis septentrionalis. Um, you could see they have much more of a naked face, uh, which is one identifying feature, but also they have those big ears and that really long pointy tragus uh, that helps us identify them. Uh, the abbreviation is MYCE, Myotis septentrionalis. Um, so the first capture um, that we got, this was, these guys were all caught within like a three week period, like one after another, which was super cool to have. Um, it was towards the end of our season, which was, which was really neat uh, just to get surprised at the end after having not gotten any, we had not gotten any target species in the three years that we were netting in this area. And it was only in 2021 that we started getting them, which was really cool. We, we have uh, positive IDs of northern long bats and little brown bats on acoustics recordings in these areas, but we've never actually personally gotten any. Um, so the first one we caught was um, much too light uh, to have a transmitter attached to her, so she was banded and released. Um, then we continued in that area, and we actually caught another one the next night, which was a juvenile female who was tagged and tracked the following day to a nearby swamp. That was that swamp picture you saw previously. Um, uh, 15 plus bats were seen emerging from the decaying trees in those areas, and we're pretty sure those were other mices. Um, I actually had to trudge through that swamp to get to a tree all the way in the background there. Uh, so you could kind of see the dedication. I got very damp <laughs> doing this. Um, but here is the best thing about northern long-eared bats. And I need to share this with everyone. This is a northern long-eared bat here. You see his little, so this is uh, the, the face of a bat, technical term, it's called the fossil. Um, it's not, a, I made that up, it's not a technical term. But at the end of your fossil, you have your nozzle, which is your nose, mouth, lips, chin. The nozzle of the fossil of this bat is heart-shaped. Isn't that cool? It's adorable. Look at that. It's a little, I'm going to go back. See the little nozzle and fossil? They got heart faces, and I think that's adorable. Um, but what can you do to help our bats besides appreciating them and thinking they're cute? You can evict your bats properly, as I talked previously. Follow your guidelines. Uh, keep it natural, uh, which is uh, if you plant plants in your gardens that attract nighttime pollinators, uh, you're providing a source of food for your bats. Uh, you can provide alternative homes. We encourage everyone to put bat houses up. Bat houses provide much needed habitat for bats. Even if you're only getting big brown bats who are not really affected by white nose syndrome as much, you're helping bats and we just need any bats, all bats to be doing as well as possible to help regulate our pests. You can also accept your bats. As I said earlier, it's perfectly uh, safe to have bats on your property or roosting in areas of your house that you know, you're not living in. Like it's, and you know, we, we want our bats to, to thrive as much as possible. Um, and also support our work. We're a nonprofit. I have to, we survive off grants and donations. Uh, so if you want to do what you can to help bats and help all endangered wildlife uh, throughout New Jersey, um, you know, volunteer uh, to help us out, donate money, things like that. I'm done being a shill. Uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the nature of nonprofit work. Um, and you know, if you really believe in the work that we do, uh, please, please check out our website, uh, conservewildlifenj.org. Uh, learn about uh, what we do and all, all the different projects we have uh, and see if you, you know, want to wanna help us out. Um, and, and that brings us to the end of our talk. I only went 20 minutes over, um, but I am willing to hang out for any and all questions y'all have. Remember, the most important thing you could do today is share what you've learned. Uh, as we said, are bats, they have so much they're up against. And one of the major things they're up against is misinformation and people not understanding them. So, so please share with as many people as possible to help uh, assuage people's fears. And that means uh, it is time for questions. Uh, so Joel, do you want to explain a little bit about how questions work? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Ethan. Man, that was really, really uh, in-depth and awesome information. I love the natural history about the different bats around the world and uh, you've made it to the Pinelands and uh, just a really great presentation. Uh, I know our followers are really going to appreciate all that uh, information and fantastic images and photos. Oh, thank you. So most of those besides the ones 
noted of other species by Merlin Tuttle, who is He's the, he founded Bat Conservation International. He is a bat photographer. His work's amazing. But a lot of these were taken by me or other biologists working here in New Jersey. Awesome. Uh, if anyone has uh, questions, uh, here is the number on the screen. Feel, uh, feel, or please feel free to call if I could talk. And uh, you know, it will prompt you to put in the ID number, or sometimes you can just hit the um, uh, number the number sign key and that'll just uh, put you right on through. But uh, we'll, we'll hang out and if anyone's got some questions, we'll be glad to uh, see if we can help you. Yeah. Let's see, do I have any more slides or videos? Nope, okay, screen sharing stopped. <laughs> okay. I'll, I, I can share my screen again if people uh, have questions that, that involve other pictures. Yeah, you just might wanna put the number back up if you can, so if yes. someone- uh, I, I'm so sorry. That's all right. <laughs> I swear I know what I'm doing. Oh, and okay, we got a, we'll get there. Okay. I just had a plug in my laptop. I had to snag on my end, but we're okay now. Yeah, just really fascinating, you know, the, the different varieties and all the important facets, the ecosystem services they, they provide are absolutely uh, so important to all of us and our economy. Yeah, I think the most important discovery I made was that they have heart-shaped noses. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, bats are, are such a diverse and fascinating group of animals. I, I am so happy to have, like, stumbled completely backwards into uh bat work and and I, I i guess the i believe the word for the study of bats is chiroptology um but it's you know i've been doing this seven eight years now i don't know the last year and a half have been uh, a blur uh <laughs> but i've i've been doing this for for quite a while and i'm i'm, I'm very uh, honored to get to work with such a fascinating group of animals. And also, it's a social crutch at parties. <laughs> if you say you're a bat biologist, uh, it gets people talking. Right. Yeah, it's really great to see them up close. You know, most people see them kind of flutter away and they never really get to see like the little teeth and, you know, their, their wings and their hands are amazing. Oh, we got oh, a caller. Yes. Oh, yes. Hello, caller. Yes. Hello. You're live on the air. Hello. Hi, how's it going? Uh, it's going pretty well. Um, I was wondering if you had any tips or uh, recommendations for where to get a bat house. Uh, like, you know, I guess imagine local built and local materials are probably best. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts on where you can get one? Maybe how much they cost? Yes, uh, I do. So on um, the Conserve Wildlife website, on our page, Bats and Buildings, if you Google um, Conserve Wildlife New Jersey Bats and Buildings, it'll be one of the, the first things where you can navigate through our website, which, cool fun fact, we're updating our website soon, so it'll be like even more user-friendly uh, over the next couple months. But I have a guide there on how to install a bat house and also blueprints on how to build your own bat house. Uh, which is the recommended maternity box, uh, which is a, a three-chambered bat house. That that's what we recommend putting up here in New Jersey. Um, if you're a little less handy um, and can't <laughs> build one of your own, I know I'm, I, I can't cut wood. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are um, a, lots of garden centers uh, carry bat houses occasionally. Uh, you could find ones to order online. I'm a particular fan of a group called BCM, uh, that's Bat Conservation and Management. They sell uh, pre-built bat houses. Um, a pre-built bat house from them uh, will probably cost uh, $50 or more. It might be within $50 to $80, depending on the size of the bat house, but I believe for around $40 to $60, they also sell uh, uh, kits, which has all of the pieces you need pre-cut and instructions on how to just screw it together uh, and throw some paint on it and uh, get that bat house up on your property. I would probably go with them because 
they would know what best what they're doing. Um, you know, they're, they're the experts. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and their their bat houses are fantastic. I love them. Uh, I've put up a a a number of them through a bats and buildings program. And, and the name of them is Bat Conservation and Management (BCM). Yes, BCM. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. No problem. Thank you for calling. You're welcome. Bye bye. See, this is extra good because I uh, I have uh, uh, worked for a while in radio. <laughs> I uh, I am a uh, I have not uh, as of late, but I am I am uh, an active DJ with Rutgers ninety point three The Core RLC WVPH FM in Piscataway. Uh, I'm DJ Batboy. Awesome. <laughs> See, please don't be shy to call. I like answering questions. Yeah, I mean that's one of the great things about uh, you know this program and other ed- education programs. People get to be aware of the, the species, but then they get to learn how they can help. And uh, just like the lady just called in, that's perfect. That's exactly uh, you know why we do what we do to to preserve and to protect. And the more we can educate, uh, you know, generally the better off uh, we're going to be. Yeah, and let me, I'm actually going to hop over to the Pinelands Commission YouTube, and let's see if we have any chat questions. Now, how do I see this chat? I there is no live have... chat. Okay, yeah, you got to call in. <laughs> yes, it, it, we do. We, we, uh, we do kind of curtail that just because you never know what will come in. But uh, yeah. That is entirely understandable. Yeah. <laughs> We've, uh, we've endeavored to make this a pretty bomb-proof uh, system, and uh, so far, so good. I uh, uh, completely understand. <laughs> yes, any more questions, please? Call in. Please call us at 1-929-205-6099. Again, that is 1-929-205-6099. Meeting ID 822-9058. Yes, hello. You're live on the air with your question. Hi. um, I was wondering with the flooding we've had all over the state recently and an explosion of mosquitoes, if um, it's beneficial for the bats this time of year right before hibernation. Hey there. So it... It could be. Um, I haven't seen any um, uh, uh, bat biologists in the area uh, making any particular observations as to that. Um, but mm-hmm. an, an explosion in, in food at this time of year would be very beneficial to bats as they're trying to uh, pack on that last bit of weight before winter. Uh, so any abundance of food is good for them. I also just just in, in response to the flooding, I, I haven't particularly seen any any um, uh, notes on uh, particularly here in New Jersey if bats were affected by that flooding, which is a possibility, um, particularly due to bats' propensity to roost in bridges. Um, um. Here in New Jersey, uh, I've actually been a part of so so I, I split my time between conserve wildlife and. Uh, working uh, with the state bat biologist, and we've done a lot of surveys for the Department of Transportation uh, as to whether bats are roosting in our bridges, and uh, they do uh, in in fairly decent numbers. Big brown bats do love our bridges, um, so there there is a possibility that some populations were were affected by the flooding. I do know, mm-hmm. in particular, down in Texas, um, uh, when uh, the hurricanes hit down there, there was lots of flooding and, and a very concerted rescue effort to save uh, some of the large free-tailed bat populations they have roosting in their bridges, uh, which was really cool to see people coming together to help uh, mitigate those effects with these storms. Um, but yeah, the events like this, you know, you, you have your, your, your plus sides and your downsides. Downsides is, you know, flooding is destructive. It destroys habitat. It affects you know, people and animals of all different kinds. But, you know, as you say, if you have uh, an explosion in insect populations, that's, you know, a veritable buffet uh, for, for our insectivores, bats included. Okay. So some give and take, I guess you could say. Yes, very much so. <laughs> yes. Thank all you right, for your question. You. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have a good one. All right. Thanks. 
Uh, yes, hello. You're live on the air with your question. Good morning. Um, so my name is Charles Johnson. Uh, Joel, nice to hear from you. This information this morning has been great. Um, my question comes to the bat roosting boxes and why they have to face a certain cardinal direction when installing them. Yes. So um, just to go through our, our, our general recommendations when it comes to uh, hanging bat houses, there's, there's two main ways you can hang a bat house. There's a, a pull mount and you could also uh, uh, place them on an existing structure, be that a garage, a barn, or your own home. Um, we, we've actually found that or on a, a freestanding pole that you like sink into the ground. Um, we actually recommend that people do hang them on an existing structure. We find that those bat houses are much more productive and more likely uh, to get resident bats using them. Um, the, the general recommendations are 15 to 20 feet off the ground, south, southeastern facing in an area where it's going to get a lot of sunlight. Uh, we do not recommend people uh, place them on standing trees because if the tree is live, it's going to have leaves that are going to shade out that bat house. Um, if it's dead, uh, there is a likelihood that that tree is going to fall, which you, you, know, you don't want that, or the bat house falling off, the tree starts to rot. And also uh, the bark on those trees gives way easier access for predators, be it raccoons or uh, certain birds, things like that, to be able to get access to the roost, and we don't want that. The reason we recommend south-southeastern facing, though, is uh, we want the bat houses to be in, an, uh, in a position where it's going to get a lot of sun in uh, the early part of the day. So you want it so that, um, you know, morning to early afternoon, it's getting a lot of sun. The bats do kind of like it warm. That's why they're, they're at home in attics and, and barns and things like that, areas that kind of have more of a, a greenhousing effect on the inside where it stays pretty warm. Uh, so south southeast uh, allows those bat houses to get lots of sun, absorb that heat, but then as it gets towards the afternoon and the evening, the sun will then have passed and uh, uh, it, it won't be as uh, much of a heating effect in the later part of the day heading into uh, when the bats will be waking up. I hope that makes sense. Yes, it did. Yeah, thank you so much for your information. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for calling. Yep, thanks for calling in, Charles, and look forward to seeing you out in the Pine Barrens uh, in the near future. Yes, look forward to soon. Bye. Yes, and since this is the Pinelands, I uh, uh, can definitely say I've spent a lot of time down in the Pine Barrens netting for bats, whether it is this, this project we're doing or uh, I, I recently did some uh, uh, putting a different type of tracking tag called nano tags on some of the migratory bats. These tags stay on for longer. Um, and they are a uh, passive uh, as, as opposed to active uh, receiver tag. So instead of tracking the bats manually, um, we just wait for the bat to pass these different towers set up. And those towers will log the uh, unique pulse put out by that thing, uh, by, by the, the tracker. Um, and that uh, data will get sent to a centralized database. And we could look up where, what towers all throughout uh, uh, the Northeast that those bats have passed. Uh, but I did that down in Peasley this summer. Um, I've done lots of mobile and stationary acoustics down there, lots of different areas. Spent a lot of time in the Pine Barrens. Still haven't seen the Jersey Devil. I'm, I'm so mad. <laughs> right. You know what? That might take you a little while, but keep trying. You never know. Yes, I need to, I need to, to keep an ear out. There's nothing like getting stranded with your car in the middle of the Pine Barrens and hearing lots of weird noises but none from the leads child <laughs> right yeah yeah uh some of the owls has some really cool calls too. some of the and, owls are terrifying <laughs> yep <laughs> i did not know that barn owl ba barred owl babies just scream they scream like children <laughs> you don't want to hear that uh you know at 2 a.m in the middle like a, a mile and a half deep down a sand road with nothing around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Pretty neat. You know, there, there is, especially, you know, the, the woods have a totally different feel when it's late at night. You know, you, you, you seem to notice more. Uh, there's a chance of coyotes calling. And uh, oh, I've, I've had some, some coyote. There's nothing like, 
uh, uh, having the break off into groups and having a few nets to, I, I was, uh, one night, uh, I had two or three nets just to myself that I had to check because the other, uh, group was a few miles away. It just so happened it was easier to break off. And I had to, uh, uh, I'll admit to being a scaredy cat hiding in my truck as a, a group of like eight howling coyotes ran through the area. <laughs> And the Pine Barrens in particular can be very spooky uh, uh, doing, doing because as I'm, I'm a North Jersey guy, I grew up in, in Morris County. I live in Union right now. Uh, and it's a very, very different biome. As people always forget just how diverse New Jersey is uh, with our, our habitats. And just, it, it's so alien. There's sand everywhere. What's going on with that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost it's like it was place. formerly an ocean. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Jersey gets a bad beef sometimes, but, you know, it's got some incredible attributes. Uh, you know, the rocky areas up north, all the water resources we have, you know, we've got the oceans and the bays, uh, you know, the, the pine barrens, pine lands. It's just, uh, you know, it's a great place to live and grow up for sure. Yeah. We get a really bad rap from people who have only, you know, driven 78 through Elizabeth and the, the parkway and the turnpike. But, you know, once you get anywhere off of those, it's so, it's gorgeous and diverse and just, just a, a fascinating place to live. Yeah, definitely to get off the, the highways, the parkway, the turnpike, the expressway and get into the, those little back roads. And uh, yeah, it's a, just a really cool, uh, you know, neat people, neat ecology, just a, a nice place. For sure. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Ethan. Like I said, that was a great presentation, some really good information. And, uh, you know, keep up the good work and uh, look forward to uh, meeting you again and talking to you in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone who called in or, you know, listened into this talk. Again, share everything you learned. Uh, you know, bats get a bad rap. We got to do everything we can to help them out. Uh, they're in your backyard. They're everywhere. Uh, and it's, you know, we, we want to be their friends in a, in a responsible manner. And again, I'm with the Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey. You could find us at conservewildlifenj.org. All right. Sounds great. Uh, we'll be back uh, next month with a program in October and we'll have another program coming up in uh, November. And on that note, I'm going to shut down the live broadcast and we'll see you out there. Bye, everyone.